My name is Carl Lurch, and I'm going to be talking about Apache Storm. I am shooting for 40 minutes. It's going to be a long talk. I'm going to try to cram everything in. I already got a late start. There probably won't be time for questions. I'm also going to probably gloss over a few things, that like hand-wavy things. So if, you, if something comes up, if you have a question, just send me a tweet directly, and I will respond to it after the talk, or just come and talk. So I work for Tilda, and our product is Skylight, and it, we're building a smart profiler for your Rails app. And I've actually built the entire backend using Storm. So another thing, if you want to talk about how that works, how we've, I've ended up using Storm in the, in the real world, I guess, we, I'll be happy to talk about it. So what is Storm? Let's start with how it describes itself on the website. It calls itself a distributed real-time computation system. And that sounds really, really fancy. The first time I thought about using it, I was like, oh, let me go look and see what Storm's all about. I saw this, I was like, whoa, step back. I'm not going to, this, this sounds like, this is too serious a business for me. I need something simpler. It took me like maybe like another six months to really, okay, I'm going to take time, I'm going to learn this. And as I got to know it, it really came to me, oh, this can be used for many, many other use cases. I'm not going to, uh, I'm at the end, if there's time, talk about some of them, but I'm going to try to get into the nitty-gritty sooner than later. So, but for now, I'm just going to say Storm is a really powerful worker system. So some things about it is distributed. It's very, very, very distributed, which is a good and a bad thing. One, the good thing is you can like, spread your load across many servers. The bad thing is your, opera, like your ops system is going to look something like this, which can turn out to be somewhat of an operational headache. So like, you'll end up running, having to run a, zoo, a zookeeper cluster. You'll end up having to run like, the storm Nimbus process somewhere. And then there's going to be a number of other storm coordination processes. There's going to be like every server is going to have the worker process. And I, you know, while you're at it, you've gone this far, let's throw in a distributed database and some distributed queues in there too. But the main point is there's going to be an operational overhead. So don't just do it for fun. There, there needs to be a good reason. If you can get your, uh, the job done on a single server, go for that. Uh, it's fault tolerant. And what I mean by that is it is able to recover and continue making progress in the event of a failure. And I know a lot of uh, existing systems claim to, claim to do this, but uh, reality is handling faults is really, really hard. So it doesn't make it like seamless. Storm doesn't make it seamless. Reality is it can't be seamless, but I think, and I'm going to talk about it later, I think the way it does it is about as easy as it can get, I hope. It's really fast, very low overhead, um, some completely useless benchmark numbers. It's been clocked at like processing over a million uh, messages per sec on a single server. Completely useless number, but it sounds good. Supposedly, it's language ag agnostic. And by that, I mean supposedly you can use absolutely any language at all to build your uh, data processing uh, pipeline. There are examples on the website where they use Bash to. I don't know why, it's probably novelty. If your distributed bash sounds good, but I guess that means you can probably use MRI. However, I've personally only used it on the JVM. It's a JVM-based pro uh, project. It's written in Java and Clojure. It uses many Java libraries. Um, I would just recommend, if you're gonna try it, try it out on the JVM. And the good news is we have JRuby, which has done an extremely good job at integrating with Java. So you can use these Java libraries, and you're just writing Ruby. Some of the things I'm going to hand wave also is exactly how to get like all the details of getting it running on JRuby. But there is a GitHub project called Redstorm. You could probably just Google GitHub Redstorm. I've realized I didn't actually include any links, but again, I can provide them later. So um, it does a JRuby binding to Storm. It also goes a bit further. It provides like Ruby DSLs for everything related to Storm. So you can define all your data transformations in terms of Ruby DSLs. So the way I'm going to kind of go over Storm is I'm going to build up a straw man. That straw man is going to be how would one implement Twitter trending topics? You know, I think I, we all hopefully know about what a, tw a trending topic is. Um, that's kind of why I picked it. It's but essentially. Uh, everybody tweets, and they can include these hashtags, hashtag RailsConf, hashtag whatever. And as the rates of single hashtags increase, like the highest, the, the hashtags that occur at the highest rate 
end up getting bubbled up and Twitter says, ah, these are the tr topics that are trending so that everybody can see what's going on. So like around here you might see, ah, RailsConf is trending. Uh, another good re reason why I picked it is it's very time sensitive and times in uh, ties into the real time aspect of Storm. All right, so to implement this, the way I'm going to uh, calculate the rate, like how often a tweet is happening is by using an exponentially weighted moving average, fancy. Um, Basically, what it means, like, as we're building up, going, like, processing the tweets, what I'm going to do is I want to count the number of occurrences of each hashtag for, like, every five seconds, let's say. The interval doesn't ma really matter. Then we're going to average them up. And, but instead of doing a normal average, which is sum up all the values divided by the number of values, we're going to do a weighted average, which is going to cause the older, like, the older occurrences to drop in weights exponentially. Uh, this is how Linux does their one-minute, five-minute, and 15-minute load averages. It's a pretty nice way of smoothing out the curves, and you can tune how you want the curves to end up getting smoothed. So first, just kind of build up some context. Let's kind of look at how one might implement this with Sidekick or, like, Rescue or whatever, any other, like, kind of simpler system that just pops off of a queue with the workers. This is what it might look like. You got your Rails app, pushes data into Redis, and then each, like the workers is, okay, I'm gonna pop a message off Redis, I'm going to read state from the database, I'm gonna process the message, I'm gonna write state back out to the database. And then the Rails app can just query the result by reading straight from the database. Here's a, it might run, I did not, can, is that right enough? Hopefully it is. The comment basically says, yes, this is very naive, I know it's, but that's not the point. Don't say, oh, you could do this a million times faster, that's not the point. Um, Hopefully it's readable. So tag, so the, the basic premise is you have a, an entry method which takes in a tweet as an argument, and it, uh, first step is to extract the hashtags from the body. So I get in, like an array of tags, then I loop over each tag and I read from the database, is there already an existing record? If so, I'm going to update the uh, moving average for it and then save it back. Oh, yeah, I put highlights. So this is how one might, uh, it doesn't really matter, it was just kind of like for uh, informational purposes, but this is how one might implement the moving average um, like function. So the, the most important part that I want to call, like draw attention to is that in the updates EWMA, the very first thing we do is catch, uh, catch up. And I didn't pass now, but in theory it should pass now down to the catch up and it will keep ticking to update the rate for every bucket that we decided were um, smoothing by. So like every five seconds, it's gonna re-update the, the rate so that it will downweight previous values and go on from there. So this is going to expose a problem with our first version of the uh, worker in that if we do not receive any tweets with a given hashtag, uh, what, how do we handle that? We need to still update the record in order to um, constantly update the rates so that, ah, oh, we're not receiving any data, we have to start um, re lowering the weight of that hashtag. So just, we'll have to end up implementing something like this, which is going to be s scheduled via cron or just regu some regularly scheduled task that probably has to run every bucket interval. And first step is just delete all the existing tags uh, that are way too old just to clear the database and then load up all the tags and update the rates for them. Make sure they're caught up. So this is going to, one thing to point out is, okay, so we now have to have a task that's going to read literally every record from the database every tick. And there probably is a better way to do this, but that's not the point. So is it web scale yet? Well, let's look. So far, not yet. But what we can do is we can start scaling out our workers. Uh, we're just gonna like, oh, let's, let's spawn up three workers. Now we're ready to handle 50,000 tweets per second. Um, well, maybe not, but we have more tr uh, tricks up our sleeve. Like we know, like I mentioned, we know that the database is gonna be a pretty big bottleneck because every single tweet we get in, it's gonna have to read state, process it, and write it back. What if we could optimize the, and remove the read state and by caching in memory? Super simple implementation, which, more is representative, it's like, oh, unless, um, like, we basically build an in-memory cache of hashtags in the process, such that every time we get a tweet that comes in, we first check our cache before trying, uh, making a new one. And we update that and save it back to the database. So let's run that through this and see what's happening. Here's the first tweet that comes, that comes through. We include, uh, 
queue up, it comes into the queue. Fancy animations, yeah. Uh, and it goes to the first worker. The worker processes it, it's like, okay, my cache is empty, I'm gonna check from the database. Nothing for RailsConf in the database, so I'm just gonna process it in memory, the count one, and we're gonna write it to the database, okay. The next tweet comes in. Ah, what's for lunch at RailsConf? Well, we know now, but it's going to be, like, again, queued up in here, and I'm sure you know where this is going. Goes to the second worker, Second worker reads the counts, and it works, increments count to two, and it goes back, writes to the database. And here's the third tweet, and we're gonna get to it. This one's gonna go back to the first worker. It's like, oh, I have everything cached. I don't need, I don't need to read from the database. No problem, count to two, and yes. Yes. This, I did this way too late. I was like, ah, I'm just gonna do a fancy animation. All right, so caching in this kind of system is not obvious. We have this problem, like, we have, um, we can still make it work. There's many things we could do. Like, we could push, like, we could push our cache external, we could put in memcache, but now we still have an external process that is required for coordinating um, the work. So uh, the main thing here is even though we have many worker jobs, there's still a high amount of coordination that's required to get this to work. Okay. Enter storm. And as you can guess, probably this is going to, like all these problems are going to magically go away when we use Storm. I wish, but it'll, there's something we can do. Let's start with some abstractions. Um, the core abstractions in Storm are the streams and the tuples. A stream is essentially a series of tubes through which data flows, um, and but they call them stream. I would tubes would have been better, and tuples are just. It's just like a, a list of values, and these values can be anything. They're really just the messages. So you can put in tuples, you can put your strings, you can put integers, you can put any objects you want as long as you can serialize it. Uh, and you, you're allowed to specify custom serialization, so as long as you can serialize it to JSON, serialize it to any serialization format, you can put that object in the tuple. Uh, the rest of Storm is going to be a series, a bunch of primitives to take these streams and tuples and to transform the data from like one representation to the other. Next, um, spouts and states. So the spouts are the source of the streams. So this is how you get data into the storm. This is the starting point of the streams. So anything that you have, want to read from the outside world is going to end up being represented as a spout. And this can be reading from Redis, reading from SQS, reading from anything. But it can also be, you could implement a spout that reads directly from the Twitter API. You could implement a spout that reads from database, you, that makes HTTP requests, that uh, gets the time of day even. And yes, you will want to actually implement a spout that gets current time of day, and I'll talk about it later. States are the opposite. States is how you get uh, the result of the transformations outside of Storm. So exactly the opposite. If you want to write outside of Storm, like write to the database, write, make HTTP POST requests, send email, push to external queues, anything like that, it's going to be uh, implemented as a state. So, so far, this is what we know about Storm. We have Spout, it starts the stream, data's gonna flow through it, and it's gonna end up at the state. Um, so far, nothing so super interesting transforms. The rest is really about how do we transform the data as it flows through. Um, and transforms are going to be purely functional operations on the data. So they're going to be given the one, given, in, given inputs, the same, it's, they're going to output the same values. Anyway. So let's add a couple uh, transforms here. So we have a spout. It's going to send some data. Then we can like filter if we need to. So we'll filter some data out and we'll aggregate it. Um, and the data will flow through and end up at the state and then get persisted. And then more transforms. Basically from here, what you end up doing is modeling your data in terms of data flow um, to get to the endpoint. And there's really, you can, there's no limitation in terms of, I mean, granted you don't add a million spouts because that will probably be crazy and you'll be, not be able to understand the code. But besides that, um, you can add as many spouts as you want. You can add as many state endpoints. You can like split the streams. You can join them and do whatever real transformation that you want. And Storm's going to take care of figuring out how to take this definition, of, like this data flow definition, and distribute it across your cluster. And this entire uh, set, basically, graph of st starting at a 
stream, uh, starting at spouts and ending at states, it's called the topology. And in a bit, I'm going to show how to define the topology. So OK, let's break it down just a little bit. So the spout is where it starts, and then it's going to emit tuples to the, fil to the filter. Generally, you're going to get the spout. Like It's going to be a pretty standard thing. Like For example, if you are pulling... If you're pulling data from Redis, and want, you will use a Redis spout that already exists. And I, it'll literally just be in your definition. Just use Redis spout. And uh, filters as well. Uh, any, any transforms can usually be abstracted up to higher level concepts and um, shared. So for example, this is how you might implement the my filter, um, the my filter function uh, or transform for Storm. So the base function is provided as part of the Storm API. And the requirement is that you define a single method that takes the uh, input as a tuple, and it will take the output, which represents the stream. So you will get in a tuple, you're going to process it, and you will then emit zero or more output tuples onto the output stream. So the first step in the filter is just get the, this, get the message out of the tuple, and this is somewhat of a Java-ish API, but it's possible to shim. So get value by field. You, in this case, we're just treating the tuple more of as a hash map than anything else. So we get the message. Is the message awesome? If so, we just output it on the output stream. And that is all that it takes to implement a very simple transform. Okay. Here's another example. And this is not something to run in production, but is super helpful for um, debugging. All right, the next step is to define the topology, like define how all the different like uh, transforms and spouts and everything hook up together. And the important part's on screen. So the define topology method doesn't matter. That's just, it's whatever. The main point is you will start at, you will get a topology object. And on that, you use a series of APIs to define how things flow together. So you start by defining the stream. And you just name it as our my spout. And you, in this case, I'm saying my queue spout, but it would be like my like Redis spout dot new specify the server the like wherever the server is and the topic you want to read from. Or if you're using SQS, you would pass in your credentials and the topic you're reading from, etc. Um, next step, usually these spouts um, will just output tuples that are raw bytes. So it'll just get the raw bytes from Redis and output it. So the next step is to deserialize the raw bytes. So we are getting a message that we are saying, ah, oh, we're expecting in, as an input a tuple that contains the field bytes. We're going to pass it to the uh, queue message deserializer. And the output is going to be a tuple that contains message. I included the uh, impl an example implementation under. And then we're going to chain that. And we're going to say, like, for each tuple that we get, we're going to expect, well, we're going to expect a tuple that contains the field message. We're going to pass it to the my filter, which will filter it based off of our predicates, and we'll output another tuple that contains message. And finally, we'll pass it to logger. Next step, run it. And the easiest way to get this running just for exper like playing around is just running it locally. And Redstorm does this, but if you want to just like the actual AP, like amount of code to get it started is, is just this. You initialize a new cluster object. You define new Trident topology. I'm going to just kind of like wave my hands over what Trident is. You can read the wiki. Um, and it doesn't really matter for the talk. You can initialize a config. And then like, there's our defined topology method. You pass them topology, and then you submit it to the cluster, which is just your locally running machine. And the entire thing is running, winning. But only a little bit winning, because we have not, we're not doing anything with the data yet. So the next step is going to be to persist the results. And again, there are higher level things that there are, like, um, there are already existing libraries. So it's just, oh, and you take in these tuples and just throw them, throw them entirely in Redis that take no code. But I'm going to jump directly down into how you would implement a state from scratch. So what it takes is you just make a class, inherit from state. This is provided for, uh, as part of the Storm API as well. Uh, you, the only methods you have to define are begin, commit, and commit. And I'm going to cover those later. Besides that, you just provide whatever you want and as an API to interact with a state. Because the next component is going to be the state updater. Uh, the state updater takes in um, 
the, requires you to define the method update state, which is going to pass in the instance of your state, and is going to pass in the input tuple, and an optional, like, it also gives you an output stream in case you want your state to emit more tuples. But in our case, we're going to, all we're going to do is ex get the message out of the tuple and call persist awesomely, and that's it for now. Except, because this Java is also factory. But, let's not mention that. Uh, so here we have, uh, I just wanted to add the state to the topology that we're defining. And we're just adding, I'm just all I did was replace the logger one, and instead of uh, logging, I'm calling partition persist, passing in the factory, I'm saying I'm expecting, and now I'll just build the state, but I'm expecting a tuple that has the field message, and I'm saying use the basic updater. And that's it for getting a very basic uh, topology running. So the next step is, let's go back to um, our initial like Twitter hashtag example. This is somewhat what, like this might be what it might look like, oh, many mites. This is what it could look like um, on, as a storm topology. You'd start with a tweet spout. However you decide to get your tweets in, uh, via Redis, via directly Twitter API, whatever, you pass it, you'd pass it to a transform, which entire, uh, which is only goal is to get the tweet body get out the hashtags and output them as tuples. The next step is going to be an aggregate, and what that's going to do is going to get all the, um, it will, it's going to get all the hashtags and track how many counts there are, and then it's going to send that to the state, and the state is going to do the moving average calculation. So this is what it might look like. Again, very, pretty basic, extract hashtags, inherits from base function. We define execute, and what it's going to do is get the tweet body out of the tuple, extract hashtags, I believe it's the same code, and loop over it and just emit new tuples. Next, the aggregator. So the first thing it does is just initial, so the, oh yeah, first the an aggregate um, function is basically just like uh, Ruby's in, inject on enumerable. So you pass in an initial uh, state, and then it's going to loop over whatever it is, pa and pass you the, so the aggregate is the iteration. It's going to pass in the state that it's building up to, as well as each tuple, and again, an optional output stream that you could output tuples in mid-iteration. So, and the init method, you return the initial state. Finally, there's going to be an extra complete method, which is, oh, we are done uh, aggregating, so let us then finally output our aggregation as tuples to the stream. And in this case, just going to loop over our, our summary, which is a hash map with the hashtag and the count. And I'm going to output tuples that contain the hash map, uh, the hashtag and the count. And hook it all up. Pretty similar. The main things with aggregate, um, aggregate functions or aggregate transforms, you want to call partition aggregate. And I will cover that uh, in a bit. And also, we're going to, at the same time, add our trending topic state. So this one might be implemented. Let's, again, we inherit from, okay, at the very top, all I do is trending topic state inherits from state, exactly the same as previously. I'm going to implement begin commit and commit uh, for now. And I'm going to leave them empty and come back to it. And the update method is going to take the hashtag and the count. And it's going to do the exact same work that it did in the sidekick one for now. So it's going to find an existing hashtag record by name and update the moving average and save it again. And the updater is going to take in all the tuples and just pass it to the state. So you might be wondering, well, I thought streams were unbounded sequences of tuples. So if that is the case, when does one call the complete method? Um, infinite time from now? I don't know. But no, what, the way Storm executes its topology is it executes in batches. So the way it works is going to be a, the Storm coordinator is going to, uh, here we go, Storm coordinator is going to tell your spout, yo spout, I'm going to just read what it says, yo spout, start batch ID 123. And the spout is going to then be like, okay, cool, we're starting batch 123, let's get some data for it. 
I fetch 200 tuples from whatever source. Like, I, I pop 200 messages off of Redis. Seems good. And it's just going to then go through everything we just saw, send the messages down. It's going to go to the hashtag function, which is then go to the aggregate function, which then go to the state. And the state's going to be persist the result and send it back to Storm. So since, uh, and then tell, tell Storm, we completed batch 123. So, what's, so what it means is, um, after, whenever there's a, t a uh, part of the API that appears to be time-based, like begin commit, commit, and in our case, um, the complete for the aggregate function, that's going to be called after every single batch. So what, when we say aggregate, um, all, like, aggregate all the counts of the hashtags, we're really just doing it for a batch. Oh, yeah, and then it's going to start the next batch. This just says start batch one, two, four. So is it web scale yet? Well, this is obviously always the answer you have to ask after every single thing, every single hour of work. Well, this is what I got so far. This is what I told you was happening. We have a tweet spout. It's sending data down a stream, a single stream, into uh, to the extract hashtags. So we have one stream, and, well, can a single stream handle 50,000 tweets per second? Uh, well, let's break it down for a bit. This is the most basic topology. This is what I said happened. This is conceptually it happens. But the way it executes is um, a stream actually has many partitions. So the number of partitions is configurable. But every single partition can, um, is completely independent. So it can run on completely different nodes in your storm cluster. So if you have eight different partitions, you're going, you have the opportunity of re both from the spout, reading from eight different servers, sending it like transforming and, per and persisting on eight different servers. You could have up to, you could have like a, a thousand different partitions if that's how far you need to go. But the main point is that you can um, split up the workload even though you have one conceptual stream, you can split it up across many partitions and thus servers and threads. So let's kind of try to work through, again, the hashtag thing through how it might work through, uh, with partitions. We have the spout. That says RailsConf. And it comes out of the spout in one partition. And because we haven't said anything yet, it's just going to send, oh, we're just going to send it to the aggregate uh, transform in the same partition, and it's going to go to the state as well in the same partition. Here's another bottom left, uh, like on the left side, another RailsConf tag. It's going to, it's in a completely different partition, so pro possibly different server. It's going to go to the aggregate in a completely different server, and ideally, what we'd want is for, at the very end, we can do the moving average calculation on the same server. So ideally, it would end up on the same state partition. But if we have another, like this is just hashtag sleep, something I would like to do, it would stay on its own partition, and it would not, like, it doesn't need to be on the same, uh, run on the same server that process, processes the RailsConf hashtag. So, but the one thing is, like, that one move from the aggregate middle partition up to a, combining into one endpoint state partition, we haven't defined yet. The way you do that is at any point you can be, oh, at this point, I want to partition my tuples by hashtag. And when we say that, what we're saying is we're specifying a field in the tuple, and we're saying, hey, Storm, we would like, once we cross this point, we would like any tuple that has the same hashtag value to end up in the same partition. So this, at this point, like up to now, Storm didn't, could actually run the entire topology in the same partition on one server. There was no need to, like, it might, I mean, you could make it do that, but there was actually no need to process, to have a tweet hit the network, basically, to go to a different node. The moment you add a partition, like, statement, you're saying, okay, yes, at this point, we're going to have to make sure that all hashtags on the same value end up on the same server, so it's going to, at this point, try, like, make sure to do that, and thus may hit the network for it. So how many partitions should we run? Well, this is very, very use case specific. You could run eight. You could run 512. Um, it, de it actually depends on your use case. But in order to answer this better, we need to talk a bit about how uh, Storm schedules partitions on the cluster. So first of all, there are many servers. 
Um, and you have a cluster, you have many servers distributed, yay. So let's say, I don't know, three servers, and um, each server could have many threads per server, because it's very, uh, very concurrent. So you might have, I don't know, 30, 40, ad you configurable amount of, ser of uh, threads per the server. And there can be many partitions per thread as well. So every, a thread in Storm is considered an executor. An executor can have um, an arbitrary number of partitions. So when you start up your cluster, like let's say you, got, you want to boot up a Storm cluster that has three nodes, you have nine partitions, three threads, so it works out pretty nice. This is how it might like start initially. So you boot up, you boot up and, um, and you have like, anyway, so it's going to assign the partitions per thread per server. So that, the nice thing of dealing with partitions, dealing with partitions is actually a, something that basically everything that ends up, ends up being pretty distributed does, like React, Cassandra, Kafka, all these things go via partitions, and because it's very nice, but it's a little t uh, tangent. So what happens is when you lose a server, oh, we don't have this execute, these executors anymore, we have all these partitions, they need to be handled still. Storm is going to redistribute them across the existing servers. So it's going to be like, okay, all these, all these uh, partitions, which represent work, uh, workload, are going to be moved to the other servers. And inversely, that's a little, that on the top is a little server box. I'm saying, oh, we're adding a server to our cluster, and then we're going to rebalance it. And Storm is going to take the existing partitions and redistribute, redistribute it across the um, available servers, probably more evenly than my little graph says, talks, uh, shows. Um, OK. It's time for some real talk. <laughs> failure. So the question is not, will there be failure? The question is, how do we handle it? Because if you're right, building a distributed system, at some point, there's going, to be fa there's going to be something that fails. And you can either close your eyes, pretend it doesn't happen, or you can think through the problems, like, how will we recover? Um, is the system going to be in an inconsistent state afterwards? Is, are we going to lose availability during, during this time? Uh, handling failure properly is probably the hardest part of building any distributed system. But it's not like you have to use really fancy technologies to build a distributed system. Like, if you build a plain old Rails app, you're building a distributed system because you have, you have the browser talks to the Rails app. And all these problems exist. Maybe we don't think about it as much because we're okay with higher error rates and inconsistencies, but let's think, like, even a simple case, like a sign-up form, like the user fills out their sign-up form and hits submit, and it errors out, what happened, right? Uh, did, the, did it fail reaching our server? Did it reach our server, and we started processing it, and, but we had an exception? Did we, like, actually create the account in the database, and the next time the user is going to refresh the page, oh, I'd like to really sign up, I'm going to try to sign up again, and it's going to be, oh, no, you can't sign up, your email, email is taken. Well, okay, how do we handle all this? And there are ways. I'm just kind of bringing up this simple case, which I'm sure everybody here has properly protected their Rails app against, because nobody in this room has ever had this bug happen. But um, I bring up, because this is a relatively simple case, and it really just gets more complicated from here. So for example, in Storm, the whole, like, it's fine. The whole point is that you may have one input tuple. Like, one message might be popped up from the queue. And as you process it, you're going to end up generating more tuples. Like, for example, we are going to, from one tweet, we are going to extract many uh, hashtag messages. And if you, as you build more and more complex topologies, this is just going to, like, this can, like, fan out. So what happens if, like, this one dies? So everything else, like, succeeded, but that one and all of its children didn't. Um, how do we then, what do we do? Do we uh, try to retry just that one tuple? If we do that, we then have to, well, we have to make, uh, track that it's that specific one that failed, that's going to in involve a lot of bookkeeping. The, and what happens if tuples have multiple parents, and one parent ended up succeeding, but not the other? It, it, 
and that's possible with Storm. You can have tuples that have multiple parents because you, you can have joins. But how does one process it? Do you retry the entire batch? It's hard. Um, I will get to how you handle it, but and the details of how Storm does it internally are really in interesting, and I would recommend you going and reading the wiki page on it, but I don't have time to talk about it. So going back to the original sidekick thing, what happens if we're like halfway through the iteration and we've per persisted some of them and we, it just explodes halfway through? Well, do we retry the message? Do we, I don't know, what, what now? Generally, we have to think about, well, when we're using a system like Sidekick or Storm, what are the message processing guarantees? Because it's going to change how you work with it. The, generally, the two, the two main ones are, are messages processed at least once or are messages processed at most once? And you can only get one, not the other. Like, you can, I mean, yes, you, can, you can't get exactly once is what I mean. If anybody says, oh, we guarantee that a message is going to be processed exactly once, they're lying. It's impossible. So the, what we can try to do is, well, storm is at least once, but what we can try to do is handle the case is, like, can we handle, if we get messages that show up multiple times, can we handle that? Can we maybe not redo the processing? Can we, like, can we try to ensure that we end up with what as close to as possible, as close as possible to processing exactly once? And the way storm tries to approach this is really pretty nice. Like I said, we have batches. Everything's processed in batches. And what Storm will guarantee is that a batch, like the next batch will not complete, like will not go reach completion until the previous one is fully committed. And it will also give monotonically increasing batch IDs. So it will guarantee that the next batch ID will have a bigger ID than the previous one. So we can combine this, and I will just tweet my slides, and it will be easier to read. But the main thing is, I'm now introducing the beginning commit and running out of time, so I'm going to try to get through this. But the main thing, if we, in the beginning commit, we get the transaction ID, what we can do is store it off and, what, and load up the state, and we'll talk about that later. But the important thing I want to reach is, uh, talk about is here, in the update function, we don't actually write to the database base anymore. We just store that in memory. And the main line is return if hashtag last transaction ID equals transaction ID. What that means is we are able to then see, okay, since we know the guarantees, if for some reason a message failed and we, re, and we reprocess the batch, we, and we, know, we can know that this hashtag actually passed, the certain po like passed that point, so we don't need to recompute the moving average on it um, and get as close as possible to exactly once. So then we store all this in memory, and once the commit happens, which happens at the end of the batch, we write all of this. We do basically do all the work that... Um, hits the outside world, which is right to the database. We do all that there. And if we reach completion, the batch will complete successfully, and we know, okay, all the messages have been successfully uh, processed, but if it fails during the persist, half of them will have the new transaction ID, and half of them will have the old transaction ID, but when the batch gets replayed and we reload that, we will see, ah, this message already finished this batch. So to roll through this real quick, I know it's I believe I'm getting really close or past my time. But so yeah, let's get data. What happens? Like a fetch 200 tuples. Boom, we go through aggregate, and it explodes. Um, eventually, the storm coordinate is going to be like up above. It says, um, "Guys, I did not get a completion message." All right, fine. Uh, spout. Let, we're going to restart batch 123 because I did not get a completion. So the tweet spot, uh, the tweet spot's going to be like, okay, I got this. I'm going to re-emit exactly the same 200 tuples in the same order that I did before. So what that means is, if we successfully extract, like if we successfully implemented our uh, transforms to be purely functional, as in completely uh, deterministic based off the input, as we go through, we're going to get exactly the same output, such that once we get to the state, I, in theory, everything's going to be exactly the same, such that when we actually run the persist, we know that if something was successfully persisted and we get the same transaction ID, we're like, well, it's going to be exactly the same output. All right. So the main catch is, of course, uh, transforms must be purely functional, because otherwise this won't work. Um, that means not ever using time.now within your transforms. I 
actually changed on the last slide, but I had to like zoom through it. The main thing is, again, one, if you have need to get the current time for a batch, one way to do it is to have a spout that only emits the current time. And if the batch gets re-emitted, it, it saves off somewhere. For this batch ID, I output it this time. And the next thing is that it's going to require the spouts to re-emit exactly identical batches, which, unfortunately, I think most um, spouts do not. Uh, I mean, most like Redis does not support. So in order to get this level of guarantees, the only queue is Kafka. And I was, would like to talk more about Kafka and why it's so awesome, but we can talk about that after. In general, even if you're not using Storm, Kafka is a really amazing tool that I highly recommend. So TLDR, Storm is a really powerful uh, platform for writing workers. It's really great for stateful jobs. And by stateful jobs, I mean jobs that depend on the result of previous ones. Um, it's good for complex data processing flows. And that's it. And I think I don't, my time wasn't up here, so I'm guessing this is about right. I really early or late? OK, cool. I didn't have the talk on here, so I'm like guessing. It didn't start. I don't know. All right, well, I'm done. Thanks. <laughs>